All right, it's 5.30, so we will call this meeting to order. Tyler, will you do the roll, please? Sure, item 1.02, roll call. Welcome to a new year of Zach. Uh, all right, I'm gonna go top to bottom list on the list here. Uh, Shannon Cooley, not here. Polly Boardman. Here. Kristen DeHaan. Here. Tyler Rogers, present. Adam Anderson. Here. Christine Hull. Present. Christy Essa. Here. Natalie Geisels. Not here. Lauren Rushing. Not here. Adriana Publico. Present. Melissa Cook. Present. Darren Fleck. Present. Mia Mansfield. Here. All right, got a quorum. All right, well, it seems like a perfect time to welcome our new members. We um, have Adam Anderson, Melissa Cook, and Mia Mansfield are all new this year, so welcome. Adam is representing Zone E, and um, Melissa is a school administrator here in the district, and Mia is part of our very important educational support staff here in the district. So thank you guys all for taking your time to be a part of our awesome committee. We are really awesome. So thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so should we, we should get rolling. Neil's ready to do his presentation. So do we need to do elections first though? Yeah, if you want to. Oh. Sure, you're allowed to take things out of order. That's part of the open meeting. If you want to take, if you no, want to. No, 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 we can do, no, let's do your presentation first. It's up to you, Chair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Would you like me to go? Yeah, okay. let's go. Okay, all right, so um, that, so introducing our new members was 2.01. So 2.02 .02 is our awesome open meeting law presentation from our chief counsel, Neil Rombardo. Yeah, hi everyone, how's it going? Um, so again, my name's Neil Rombardo. I'm the Chief General Counsel for the school district, and I'm proud to be your assigned attorney, which is great. This is one of my favorite committees, and uh, you do some very important work. And so the message that I'd first like to start with is that the superintendent and the board of trustees, thank you for your participation in this committee. As you can see from the beginning of our memo that we passed out tonight, that your role in doing this work for them is is vital and as many of you may know, well I know many of you know this, is that the board takes your advice and your opinions and how you vote and the actions that you take very seriously and they rely on you and they rely on your advice and when they don't like something you do, they don't just ignore you, they'll send it back uh, for you to uh, reconsider uh, and put in new input and look at things from a different angle and sometimes you still disagree and then at that point they might vote to disagree with you, which they have the right to do. Ultimately, with your committee, the Board of Trustees is the ultimate decision maker, but again, they take into account very much what uh, you provide and what you send forward. So tonight, I'm gonna talk to you about the open meeting law. For many of you, this is a repeat performance, and uh, for some of you, this will be new. How many did, I know there's a couple new folks. How many of you know about the open meeting law? Okay, all right, that's good. All right, Adam, I'm going to focus on you then. So, uh, <laughs> so um, basically, the open meeting law governs any public body. You are a public body by Nevada law under NRS 241. Uh, you would be defined as an advisory body to the Board of Trustees, and therefore you have to comply with the open meeting law. And to make it really easy, if a majority of you are going to make a decision about anything related to zoning, you got to do it in an open, you have to have an agenda, and you have to vote, and the majority of that vote has to, uh, the majority of the quorum has to vote on the item for it to pass. And then if it were to pass, it would go to the Board of Trustees. Uh, so that's really, really simple. And it's, I used to present on the open meeting law many, many, many years ago uh, um, under now you and our President Sandoval when he was the Attorney General. And um, I used to go around the state and give presentations. And the golden rule that we created at the AG's office was, if you're not sure, do it in an open, and you can never violate the open meeting law. 
So that's the real uh, crux of this presentation. But what I'm going to do today, and uh, many of you have seen my slide presentation, I thought, why repeat that? So uh, I just created this memo. I put in some new statutes. So I'm just going to walk you through this and how it works, okay? So basically, a meeting occurs when you have a quorum of the public body. How many members do you have in your body? I don't remember off the top of my head. Is it 11? 13. Okay. So you have 13 members. A quorum is more than 50%, so that's seven members. And then you can hold a meeting with seven members. And here's the fun part. A majority of seven is how many? Four. So you can actually pass an item with only four votes of your entire committee. And that would be actually a, a appropriate action under the open meeting law. So the open meeting law governs how you conduct meetings and how you take action on uh, items that are on an agenda. So we just covered page one. Not too bad, right? Painless? Did we do all right? Okay. So this is new to, um, and we do experience this in the district. I wrote this memo for the entire, um, for all public bodies. So this isn't really applied to you, but we have public bodies where there are vacancies. And when there are vacancies, the new law under AB 52 of this legislative session says that anytime there's a vacancy, the membership of that public body is decreased now. And there was always a, there was, it was never very clear, so we always opine that we should still count it, and unfortunately that person just, there's no vote coming from there, so it's in effect a no vote. The legislature has made it clear that any public body, if there's a vacancy of a voting member, then that would shrink the number of uh, folks that are on the committee. So in your case, you have 13, you would, if there was a vacant spot, you would go down to 12, but then your quorum is still, guess what, seven, and your vote would then still be four. So it doesn't really affect you much if you only have one vacancy. It's when you have two vacancies that would change how a meeting would occur. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, great. Um, and then there is an action, uh, action like I told you, that's a vote of the majority of those who are present, so a properly noticed meeting. And then the meeting defined is basically, again, a quorum. But what I want to talk to you about, and this is the big red flag, so everyone pay attention to this part, okay, is what you really have to avoid is what are called serial communications. So serial communications, or what they call a walking quorum, is when you start discussions with one person, and you walk over to the next person, and you just have a discussion with them, and then you walk to the next person. And at some point, when you hit that quorum level, for you all, seven, when you have a discussion with seven people about the same topic, then you are now conducting a meeting because you didn't, you're not going to agendize that you're going to walk from room to room, right? So you didn't have a notice, and because you didn't have a notice, that would be a violation of the open meeting law. So let me give you the example that was done here in the state of Nevada. We'll talk about the Board of Regents. For the university system, this is a true case, so it's factual. They wanted to remove a chancellor way back in the day when they had fax machines, so they sent faxes to each other and basically voted through fax machine in an unnoticed meeting to terminate somebody's position, and they were found in violation of the open meeting law. So don't uh, commit serial communications. So here's how you're going to do it, and you're not even realizing you're going to do it. Text. You've got to be really careful if you're texting each other about anything on the agenda. Just the easy answer is don't do it. Don't text each other, and then you don't have an issue. The other area that you're going to do it is you're going to do it via email. Don't email each other about agenda items. Can you email each other about setting up the meeting? Sure, because you don't vote on that. But do not email each other about agenda items. The only person who should be emailing you is Adam and or his team about, we're going to have a meeting, here's the attached agenda, you know, and that's what we're going to discuss. If you want to respond to Adam, do not hit the reply all button because then you've just brought in 
all of this, right, your entire quorum. Just reply to Adam. Now, Adam probably will send you all communications as blind carbon copied so that you can't hit the reply button because if you do, you're still only replying to him. But if he or his team makes a mistake and does send it, not blind carbon copy, please do not reply all. Reply to him if you have questions about an agenda item. Does that make sense? Okay. So serial communications, avoid them. Be really careful on your phones. The last place that I'm going to suggest that you're very careful in this committee has, um, I don't want to say it's an issue because it wasn't an open meeting law issue, but it could have become one, and this was several years ago. I don't think any of you were on there. Maybe Polly, you might have just got on the board, but uh, this committee um, was be careful on Facebook too because if you're all participating in a conversation and you all kind of agree that, yeah, all the families are correct, we should move the zoning from this area to this school, that can be considered an action if a quorum of you were to weigh in like that. So really be careful on your social media and your electronic communications. I really, really advise that you uh, don't communicate those ways. You are more than welcome to listen to what people say through social media. That is okay. But really avoid a conversation back and forth because what might happen is Adriana gives one point, Christine gives one point, Tyler gives a point, Adam gives a point, Polly gives a point. Guess what we're getting close to? A quorum. And that's serial communications and that's an open meeting law violation. Okay? So really, really avoid uh, doing that um, as, as a majority or a quorum. Uh, so that is technically in the definition of meeting, serial communications. But what I did put in here is the new definition, one of the new additions to the definition of meeting, and this was just adopted by the legislature, and I kind of bolded it for you all, is um, it does not any longer, they, the legislature specifically said that a meeting does not include any gathering or series of gatherings, that's that serial communication that I'm telling you about, where you get together to not talk about agenda items. So that was nice. And what happened was is the legislature had a bunch of exceptions in the definition. And Sarah Montavo, who you guys might know, she works for us in the Office of General Counsel. And I served on the Attorney General's uh, task force to rewrite the open meeting law. We said, get rid of all these exceptions and just say, a meeting is when they meet to decide on something within their jurisdiction. And it's not when they're doing something else. Like, if you all want to go out and have dinner, fine, not a problem. Don't talk about zoning, which probably you will, because that's probably what bind, uh, holds you together. So think about that a little bit. But it, you know, if you want to do that, that's not a meeting and not a violation of the open meeting law. In the past, it was an issue for a lot of uh, public bodies. Many of you know uh, my past is I was uh, in Carson City and the Board of Supervisors were five, and I would always say, look, one of you stand in one corner, you stand in the other corner, you stand in that corner, you stand in that corner, and Mary, you stand in the middle. And that's how you avoid open meeting law violation, right, when you're not here at a meeting. Because inevitably, when you all get together, you're going to talk about zoning stuff. So really be careful in your social uh, interactions as well. So... Um, Here's some requirements that are required by all, uh, for all open meetings, and I put this in here because I think it's important to realize the amount of work that goes into every one of these meetings. It's not just as simple as, hey guys, let's get together, you know, so we have to create an agenda. The agenda has to be very, very specific. It has to have, of course, time and date. All right, that seems easy. Location, also easy. But then it has to have specific uh, items related to public comment. The public, the way we do it at the Washoe County School District, are permitted to make comment on all action items. And then at the end, you have to have a public comment period for general public comment that's related to your jurisdiction. So those are that's technical. If you miss that, that's a violation of the open meeting law. The other thing is every single agenda item must be clear and complete. I read every one of your agendas to make sure that they're clear and complete. 
someone on my team reads every single agenda in this district. I read most of them because I represent the most public bodies, but it's the clear and complete standard. If you fail to meet that, that's an open meeting law violation. The other thing is we have to post this on uh, in multiple public locations three days before the meeting. If we fail to do that, that's an open meeting law violation and you can't meet. Um, we have to post it online. If we don't do that, that's open meeting law violation um, or we wouldn't let you meet. That's how you avoid it, right? So there's all of these very, very, very technical things that go into the open meeting law that you guys don't even see going on behind the scenes. So I only point that out because sometimes I know it's frustrating that you might only meet once a month and you're like, hey, we've had this happen. We want to meet next week. It's next to impossible to get a meeting together of a public body within one week because you have to post three days in advance. You can't count weekends. So you're already missing two of the seven days in a week. And then you have to get clear and complete agenda items on and you have to get them all posted and you have to all do that within three days. So you can see you're running out of it just that time frame just by pure math, right? So plus we have a lot of public bodies in this district. The majority of them use this space because we have good audio and good video. We get a lot of complaints when we go off site, which we're working on uh, rectifying, but we get a lot of complaints when we go off site. And so, um, uh, that's another issue is so we have to get space. And so that's another problem. So we just, I want you to know what goes in behind the scenes, what goes on behind the scenes. And this is just a very, I'm giving you the, 30,000 foot level. It's even more detailed than all of this. So that when Adam says, well, we're not gonna be able to do that next week or not in two weeks, you understand why and where we're coming from as, as staff. It's not that we don't want to respect your, your wishes. It's, we just literally can't, uh, can't follow through. Some other technical things that we have to do is besides having a clear and complete agenda item, every single item that you're going to take action on must contain the term for possible action on it. And if it, that's a new thing in the open meeting law, it hasn't always been that way, but it's now required. And so keep that in mind. If you're going through an agenda, if I'm not here, you don't have action items. Uh, um, my hours are long enough. So if I can sneak out, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm going to sneak out. So if you don't have action items, I'm gone. Uh, so keep that in mind. Cause if I'm not here, guess what you're not doing voting. So if you guys start voting, realize, Oh wait, Neil's not here. We probably shouldn't be doing this. And Adam will keep you in line on that too. But just keep, just remember that. That's a little tip of my attendance. Um, so there's some other things we have to do to comply with the open meeting laws. We have to do, um, uh, we have to make sure that we're uh, accessible, you know, ADA accessible, accessible for uh, folks so that they can attend the meeting and participate in the meeting. And all of, uh, and so we have to meet those criteria. Um, so moving on to page three, and I guess I kind of already covered this, so I messed up. I jumped ahead on my own memo that I wrote just a couple hours ago, but sorry about that. Uh, the pitfalls, I talked to you about uh, the things to worry about, and it's all written out on that last page regarding serial communications. So I really um, can't stress enough, avoid serial communications, be very careful on electronics. I also want to recommend to all of you uh, unless you're a district employee, it's, it's fine if you use your email, but if you are a private citizen, do not use your employer's email to do district, uh, to do zoning business. Okay. The reason why I'm recommending that is because if somebody does file a complaint or somebody does want to get a public record, so I'm doing a little shift to public records here, then you're your work email becomes exposed to that public records request because anytime you're doing business for this committee, that's a public record. And that was decided by the uh, Nevada Supreme Court in the um, Lyon County case. Was Lyon County was related to text messages. That text messaging became, uh, the texts were considered a public record. So just keep that in mind. So if you do have a, an email or your private citizen and you have an email and you planned on using your work, do not sign up for one of the free services. Obviously we would prefer that you sign up for a more secure one, 
I don't know that this this land is beyond my scope. All right, guys. Like I use Yahoo, and everyone's like, "Why do you use Yahoo?" Look, give me a break. You know, so I use Yahoo, use Gmail, use whatever works for you. And what I would suggest you do is, you know, like if it was me, I would put Neil Zoning at Gmail dot com or at Yahoo dot com or at AOL dot com. I think those still exist. The point is, is then everything that comes through there is zoning stuff. And if we do get a complaint or we do get a public records request and I need to see your emails, I'm not going through your personal emails. I don't want to go through them. You don't want me to go through them. So I just strongly suggest that for our employees, you know, you guys can just slide it into a folder and just say, here, Neil, here's my folder of zoning uh, stuff. That's what I do. I have a folder for every client. You'd be a client. You have your own folder. Hey, hey. So, um, so that's just food for thought for all of you. Uh, the other thing that's super important, uh, stick to the agenda. I put it here in all capital letters with exclamation points, so I'm yelling at you. Stay to the agenda. We got to stay to the agenda. So if Adam says the agenda is we're going to talk about schools in Spanish Springs and we're going to talk about these five schools in Spanish Springs, do not start talking about Galena uh, or, or Damani or something like that. It's we're here and we're up in Spanish Springs. We're not down there. So just keep that in mind, too. OK, stick to the agenda. I know that all of you probably come here and you have some of your own ideas and stuff, and that's great, but they have to still relate to the agenda, all right? So that's a really easy way to kind of violate the open meeting law. So make sure you do that. And um, I covered the public records issue that I wanted you to be careful with. The, let me also just express one last thing related to the emails, and then I think we're good to go, and I'd be happy to take questions is the other thing, if we did get a public records request, the la last thing you want is a court going into your emails, right? So just one more reason to, like as public employees, all of our stuff is public. I have a little protection because I'm a lawyer, so I can say it's attorney-client privilege or confidential or attorney work product. But most of my colleagues in the district, you don't get to claim that. So you know your stuff's public. But if you work for a private group, and your private employer doesn't really want their emails gone through, what a court will do is they'll go into chambers and they're going to go through your email system to find public records if the other side can make a reasonable argument that they're in there. So just really, I can't stress enough, get, your, get a separate email uh, for that so that you don't have that issue, okay? Um, are there any questions? Was that as clear as mud? Was that better than the slideshow? I'm just curious. Not so much. Okay. <laughs> uh, how are you? Good to see you. Good. Anyway, any, anything else? Any questions? You guys feel good? You're always welcome to reach out to Adam with any open meeting law questions, and then he'll get them to me. And the only reason why I ask that you do that is he needs to know what's going on as the liaison to the, to the public body, because it's not fair to him for me to be giving you guys advice behind his back. So you're the liaison, right, for these guys? Yeah. So, yeah, go to Adam if you would. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, All right. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Neil. That was great. All right. Um, we have some awesome members of the public here. So since we just had this conversation about public comment, I just want to let you all know that if you'd like to speak tonight, um, Kelly has the, the little cards over there, and you can give them to, to her. Um, so... We do have two items for action, which are our chair and our vice chair. We are, we do not have, Spanish Springs is not for action. However, I'm gonna make a wild guess that you're all here to share your feelings and your thoughts. Um, so so we, will, we will get there. So if you want to speak on that item, um, even though it's for information only, we will we'll take some comments on that tonight because it helps us to to ask questions. So make sure that you give Kelly your um, your form for that. Before we move on, I yes. just want to amend the record that we have two additional members that oh, yes. joined. Thank you. Natalie Geisels and Lauren Rushing are here. Thank you. And I also failed to mention that Adriana Publico was reappointed to her her position on the on the board by the by the school the trustees last week. So thank you for continuing your commitment 
many, many years of commitment to this committee. You're not allowed to leave, by the way. I just, you and Polly are here for like long term. We need your historical references for that. Okay. Um, any additional questions about open meeting law? Everybody good? If you have additional questions, make sure you um, include Adam on any emails too um, about your emails or, or anything like that. So let's move on to item 2.03, discussion and possible action to select a chair of the Zoning Advisory Committee for the term ending June 30th, 2024. Um, this uh, chair will come from our current membership, Adam Anderson, Polly Boardman, Sh Shannon Coley, Melissa Cook, Kristen DeHaan, Christy Essa, Darren Fleck, Natalie Geisels, Christine Hull, Mia Mansfield, Adriana Publico, or Tyler Rogers, or Lauren Rushing. So this one is for possible action. So we will take some nominations. <laughs> I move to nominate Christine Hall for chair of the Zoning Advisory Committee. Holly Morgan mm -hmm. second. Do we have any additional nominations or discussion? Um, Kelly, do we have any public comment? Pablo Navadaran. Hi, Pablo. Welcome back. Uh, welcome back. Hello, guys. Long time no see, so, and uh, I'm about to leave this meeting early, so I will nominate Christine Tall for the record, so thank you. Any other discussion? Do we have, did we have any other public comment? I'm sorry. There's no more public comment. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm happy to continue to serve as chair. I really do enjoy it. Only if my partner in crime will continue to, to, to be, but we'll, we'll get there next. We'll get there next. <laughs> um, so we will take a vote. Um, all in favor. Aye. 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 Ooh, we had some feedback. Um, any opposed? All right. Motion passes. Good work. Good work. Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. All right. Um, discussion and possible action to select a vice chair of the Zoning Advisory Committee for a term ending June 30th, 2024, from the current membership Adam Anderson, Polly Boardman, Shannon Coley, Melissa Cook, Kristen DeHaan, Christy Essa, Darren Fleck, Natalie Geisels. Uh, Mia Mansfield, Adriana Publico, Tyler Rogers, and Lauren Rushing. Do we have any nominations? Polly Wortman, I move to nominate Tyler Rogers for vice chair. Kristen DeHaan, I second. Do we have any public comment for item 2.04? Pablo Navadaran. Hi, Pablo. Welcome back. This is my probably my last public comment for the, today. So I wanted to say I will nominate Ty Wedger for for vice chair for the board. For the board. So thank you, Tyler. Would you like to continue as vice chair before we vote? I'd be delighted to. Okay, just want to make sure we're not throwing you in for something you're not up for. <laughs> Do we have any other discussion? All right, let's take a vote. That was, that was quick. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, congratulations, Tyler. Thanks for the support. Okay. So moving on, um, oh, we do have action on this, I'm sorry. Uh, 2.05, um, action to approve the minutes from March 16th uh, of our, Advisor, do we have any changes? Anybody notice anything? Okay. No discussion on that? Okay. So then I'll take a motion to approve. Lauren Rushing, motion to approve. Okay. Second. Tyler Rogers, I second. Kelly, do we have any public comment on this item? No public comment. All right. Any discussion? All right, we will take a vote to approve the minutes from March 16th, 2023. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Any opposed? All right, motion passes. Uh, minutes are approved. And well, now we, see, Neil's leaving the building, so no more action, guys. <laughs> okay, um, I believe this is what all of our audience is here for, and um, thank you for driving out from Spanish Springs. Not quite, we're not there yet. I'm lying, oh my gosh. Cadence, first. Look at me, I'm skipping ahead, I'm sorry. I was trying to get you all out of here earlier. This will be really quick, and then, and then we'll be at, at the, that agenda item. Um, okay, so Adam is next for our anticipated cadence of this committee um, and any potential timeline for rezoning for this year. And this is for discussion only. So Adam. Thank you, Chair Hall, and good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate the work you do together with the district. Um, this is an item that I've used in the past just to really help keep everyone a little bit centered and on the same rhythm for the work that we're hoping to accomplish and the pace we're hoping to accomplish it. It is entirely a draft document. It is really just for orientation's sake. Um, we probably won't have it at every meeting, but especially other committees don't meet every month like you all do, so I find this helpful. Um, we're skipping tonight, because we know what we're doing tonight. Um, October, I have uh, a potential substantive informational only up uh, enrollment update. I think sometimes that's insightful. We're staring at those numbers often and deep and trying to uh, derive conclusions from them. And I think we'd, uh, it'd be interesting and valuable to share that with you. But really the work that is in front of this committee is going to begin tonight. So in October, we anticipate um, possible action on enrollment adjustment or boundary adjustments in the Spanish Springs area. Should we not, uh, achieve action in October, really that is likely to be the sole item uh, on the agenda for November. So, you know, in the past, uh, that third Thursday, we meet every third Thursday of the month, it's just the way it's been run. So it's not that, not that we couldn't change that, but that's been the rhythm and it's, it's worked out well, except for in December, which often gets a little bit too close to the holidays and somewhat convenient to cancel. So I don't have um, anything anticipated for December or January and going into the spring now this is again presuming that we are able to um, land the decisions that are going to begin discussion here tonight should they carry into 2024 you know we would as well that said um, you know we're going to talk later this evening about the district's facility modernization plan some really exciting important work taking place there we'll talk about more later but the uh spoiler alert is that the board's anticipated to hear and potentially approve that plan in december which may well um, create projects that warrant action of the zoning committee um, and that's kind of what might um, i guess dominate the spring agendas so uh, we've also got some work that that's the uh, item two there in February um, we've got some work uh, to continue to improve upon and, and uh, modernize the online registration and variance processes that's uh, ongoing work by the by the district staff that by February we uh, should be able to update this committee on it's it's an important variable in the work that you guys do um, Administrative Regulation 7087 um, on school closure uh, has recently been updated and you know, doesn't come into play at this time, but should it come into play in the not so distant future, um, you know, it'd be a good, good opportunity to update this committee on what, what your responsibilities include. Um, and then really, like I said, just uh, looking into the spring that's a little far into the future anticipate that the facility modernization plan recommendations will be the kind of the dominant topic of discussion. That said, there is nothing else on our horizon, i.e. a new school that necessitates rezoning. We've had that often in the past where there's a real mandate uh, to adjust some boundaries because we are under construction with the new school. We don't have that in front of us um, for this school year. So, you know, we'll discuss as a group um, when and if we need to meet um, beyond the Spanish Springs conversation. So that's really it 
any questions or in the future if you have uh, agenda items desired you can work uh, through chair hall and we can try to get those on the agenda thank you adam for uh, for seeing the future um, neil brought this up but i'm curious historically we've gone out into the community and i know that's been an issue with av support i think it's really a valuable thing when we will go out and meet the communities that we are we are discussing so i'm just curious sort of where that ability stands for the committee to go out into these these schools and hear and make it easier for those communities to engage with us um, we're acquiring the necessary equipment to at least have at the ready um, should the need arise you know lots of important requirements around open meeting law would likely um, choose a venue that's suitable to begin with but any of these types of tools that would need to go on the road um, we're securing them so when and if the need arises we'll be able to do that so does that mean that the, the, the expectation or sort of the plan is that we will be here de facto that the, like we're sort of deviating from that that standard that we've done for the past few years of going out and it's because it's a limitation of like sort of I guess staff I mean maybe for the good of the context of the membership you know this committee um, more de facto met in the communities in which they were considering change um, meetings like this that were um, less specific or not so much for action were here um, that really changed with COVID I think was when we got into a different rhythm um, and just never got back and there's a few different reasons for that not the least of which is just the burden of taking this show on the road um, but when the the, the situation warrants um, it, it is important to me as well in the district to facilitate these types of conversations closer to the areas that they're impacting if for no other reason to, to lower the barriers for participation for the members of that community to come and listen and, and uh, provide input so uh, I would anticipate that the October and possibly November meetings for potential action in Spanish Springs may be held at schools in the Spanish Springs area that's not been uh, decided yet and we'll certainly update you when it has but that's the direction that we're working towards that's great here and certainly has my support yeah I agree that would be wonderful so as soon as you're able to update on us on that would be great okay any other questions about our cadence for the year all right all right, so now we will move to the biggie for this this year. 2.07, introduction and discussion regarding enrollment boundary adjustments that um, might be impacting John Bohatch Elementary, Bud Beasley Elementary, Jesse Hall Elementary, Miguel Sepulveda Elementary, Spanish Springs Elementary, Alice Taylor Elementary, Edward Van Gorder Elementary, Yvonne Shaw Middle School, Lou Mendive Middle School, and Sky Ranch Middle Schools for the 24 and 25 school year. As we stated before, this particular item is just for information and it's really, really like the early stages of it. So we are so grateful for you all driving here tonight. And please know that we will be asking a lot of questions and we value your input. So if you would like to say something about this item, typically we, we don't always take public comment, but I think it's really important that we take it on this particular item tonight. So we will take public comment on this item after the presentation. So if you have not filled out a card, please do. Um, again, we do thank you for, for coming out here for this item tonight. So um, Adam, back to you on our presentation. Excellent, thank you for that intro. It's exactly, this is a, this is a warm up. Um, before we begin, uh, something very important to the district is this promise that we've recently finalized with our board of trustees it's worth reading out loud we will know every student by name strength and needs so they graduate prepared for the future they choose and we will deliver on this promise in partnership with our families and community sort of a grounding uh, grounding statement before we embark on any serious work so just as by way of context um, this uh, topic was considered by the Board of Trustees just recently on September 12th um, they were presented with three options to proceed regarding the uh, enrollment 
pressures at Bowhatch to build a new school, to just do nothing, wait and see, or to rezone. And the board clear the, the board um, deliberated extensively and ultimately voted to direct staff to initiate rezoning in that area immediately. So that's why we're here tonight. Um, we did not get into discussion with the board regarding Sky Ranch Middle School's enrollment, but they are also overcrowded, and we are proposing to um, rebalance that enrollment and the boundaries for both elementary and middle school levels with this work. So a little bit of background as well. Um, Sky Ranch opened in 2019, um, and that affected the boundaries of Shaw, uh, Sparks Middle and Mendive at that time. This is a little hard to read, but the key there, the legend up at the top shows that the blue lines were the original boundaries. So you can kind of follow my cursor or try and follow on your printout. Uh, this was Shaw up north. Sparks went and took the east half of Sun Valley and a little chunk near the Galleria there. Uh, and then Mendive had basically everything to the south. Now the white boundary are the current uh, boundaries, including Sky Ranch, taking a portion out of what was Shaw, also taking uh, basically Beasley out of Mendive, and uh, at the time Desert Skies came in and modified the situation for the rest of Sparks Middle. So, but today, Sky Ranch is over capacity with two portables on their campus. You know, talk about this in a couple slides but each portable has two classrooms in it so that equates to four additional classrooms uh, on their campus today at Sky Ranch I think I somehow skipped over the elementary school boundary by accident and didn't notice it but same uh, sorry about that on the slide prior same information it's a little bit harder to step through but the green lines represent the pre Bowhatch boundaries. Bowhatch opened in 2020, the year after Sky Ranch, and impacted the enrollment boundaries of Hall, Sepulveda, Spanish Springs, Taylor, and Van Gorder. Did not modify the boundaries of Beasley, uh, but today Bowhatch is overcrowded, and they have four portable classrooms on their campus today. Next slide is our Adam, sorry, sorry just really quickly just to orient everybody Bowhatch and Sky Ranch are actually on the same property as well like they're literally next door to each other so that's that's just uh, in addition to schools that are also having students in and out on the same road I think that's something that we should all be aware of in case you haven't driven out there it's a lot that's a lot of people going to two schools so something to consider Good point, appreciate that. On uh, this slide, we have all the current boundaries overlaid with the schools. So it's a little hard to see on the screen, but right in the center, you see the names and labels of Bowhatch and Sky Ranch. They are actually on the same parcel. Creates additional kind of compounding congestion. So this slide depicts the elementary, middle, and high school boundaries. Um, the colors of the lines are the the colors of the schools correspond to the lines, right? So the yellow dot for Reed High School is illustrated by this yellow line. And up above the yellow line or to the north is Spanish Springs territory. Uh, the blue lines represent the middle school boundaries. So um, kind of like what we just showed, this is uh, Sky Ranch today that has both Beasley and Sepulveda go in their entirety to Sky Ranch and then in their entirety to Reed High School. Whereas uh, Sky Ranch has this boundary that encompasses Van Gorder and Bowhatch, and they go to Sky Ranch and then to Spanish Springs. Up here north, if you will, of this blue line, you have Shaw Territory, Shaw Middle School, all of Hall, all of Taylor, all of Spanish Springs today go to Shaw and then to Spanish Springs High School. So this is just an orientation. Um, I put this note on here uh, regarding uh, split feeders as a term you'll hear from time to time. Uh, we worked very hard over the last several years to nearly entirely eliminate all split feeding at the elementary school level. 
So as I mentioned, Beasley in its entirety matriculates up to Sky Ranch Middle School. We're not able to eliminate it in its entirety across the district from middle to high uh, for a few different reasons, not the least of which, as you can see here, uh, is just the geographic distribution, right? Sky Ranch is, you know, basically equidistant between Reed and, and um, Spanish Springs, so it's uh, pretty hard to avoid some degree of splitting of the student body from Sky Ranch to different high schools. But as we proceed forward with this, it's an important concept that we try to emphasize to not create split feeding or act to minimize it to the best of our ability. Total orientation slide. This is getting a little more dense, but it's uh, a graphic that you're gonna see a lot of going forward. So just for orientation's sake, you got the color legend at the top. Um, as you can imagine, you know, cool colors, under enrollment, warm colors, nearing and exceeding capacity. On the left hand side columns, you have the school names, you have the maximum rated capacities. That's, you know, if every classroom in the school was filled with their uh, maximum amount based on school district uh, student to teacher ratios, that's how many students could possibly fit in those schools. We don't like to operate our schools at 100% capacity for a few different reasons, but that's where we start from. The second column there is the temporary capacity, so those portables I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, for example, Bowhatch with four portables equating to eight classrooms at a maximum capacity of 25 students per classroom is how you get to that number of 200. However, when you move to the right, you see the enrollments on the top rows uh, divided into the maximum capacity. The temporary capacity is not factored into that, okay? Even though those are classrooms and those are seats for those students and those classrooms are furnished with the same uh, technology and equipment that is inside the, the building itself, it doesn't expand the uh, cafeteria, it doesn't expand the music room, it doesn't expand the parking lot. Um, so we don't consider that in a part, as a part of the uh, utilization percentage calculation. So then moving forward to the right, you see the current enrollments and associated utilization percentage um, in that uh, next column. And then going forward, we have the projected enrollments. We're not going to get into a ton of detail tonight about how we go about uh, calculating those projections, but uh, suffice it to say it's, it's an art and a science. But we spend a great deal of time and effort on it, um, and we'll likely talk about that quite a bit in the future. This is the way we see that future going. You can see today Spanish Springs Elementary School, for example, um, is in the, in the cool range with only 444 students or thereabouts um, well below their rated capacity and Bowhatch above its rated maximum capacity. We also threw in these cumulative total rows both for the elementary and middle school level to give you at least a sense of if this was uh, you know a spreadsheet that we could uh, equally distribute all the students that there is um, enough seats in this region to serve all those students comfortably. Um, down in the middle school section, you can see some similar imbalanced enrollment distribution with Shaw in the 760 some percent range, whereas Sky Ranch is running at or ex ex projected to exceed capacity in coming years. So that is still really just an orientation. Okay, now we're going to uh, start to warm up your muscles on what we might do about it. Adam, uh, <clears throat> Adam can I yes. add something just to consider too? Uh, Mendive's numbers include almost 200 variances. So if you took just their zone kids, you would be down to 714. So that, that number is accurate, but that includes 170 kids from Dilworth, which is 20% of our population is, uh, represents, you know, considerable um, 
Well, Dil Dilworth being a Title I school, and it puts a lot of pressure on a school like Mendive who doesn't get additional resources through title money uh, to deal with a larger population than just ideas like that. So thank you. Appreciate that point. Variances are an important variable and are taken into consideration with our projections. Uh, and we'll talk about that in more detail in future future presentations. Yeah, so I think on that note, maybe next next time, could we just have a quick overview of the district's new variance policy and why we're, we might see more variances this year than we have in, pa in past years? You bet. Okay, just like one little blurb about that. I think that would help um, the, the committee to understand that a little bit better. Of course. So again, uh, a couple of draft options to really start to wrap your mind around how we might go about redistributing these students. Option one, again, you're seeing the existing uh, elementary school boundaries outlined in orange and the existing middle school zones uh, just shaded in blue. Light blue up here for Shaw, dark blue, of course, for Sky Ranch. And we've outlined the areas that we're proposing to move or rezone. This one here would go from Bohatch to Sepulveda. And this area um, south or west, east, sorry, of Vista, uh, Wingfield Hills, would move into Van Gorder. And this area, which is part of the new Stonebrook uh, subdivision, would move into Spanish Springs. Um, with this option one, Spanish Springs Elementary School, so that's the elementary school moves. Uh, Sepulveda goes to Sky Ranch, as does Bohatch, so there would be no change at the middle school level in this option. This area up north, uh, should this area move into Spanish Springs Elementary School, Spanish Springs Elementary School goes to uh, Shaw Middle School, so this area would also move, be recommended to be moved into Shaw Middle School as well. Um, with this portion of option one, not only are we proposing to move this community into Shaw, or pardon me, Van Gorder, uh, rather than Bohatch, all of these neighborhoods are part of the Bohatch zone currently, but with this option one, we're also proposing to rezone Van Gorder in its new entirety into Shaw. Okay. And th this is the current, and this is the after. So you can see those neighborhoods, uh, those, those orange lines adjusting, and this would be the resulting enrollment boundary for Bohatch. And then you see also those shades adjusting, uh, illustrating the new enrollment boundary of Shaw Middle School taking on Van Gorder, all of Van Gorder, and this new area of Stonebrook. Adam, as we start to dig into the maps, I think what I've found very helpful in the past is your knowledge around planned development in these areas. And this is obviously a part of town that is developing and growing fast. So can you orient us to any knowledge you have of, of like future community development that's planned? I'm, I'm specifically also curious about this like random square that feels to the bottom right that is empty, but it's like zoned. I'm just curious if like that's an area that is anticipated to be grown into. Right here? Uh, uh, but below that. This thing right here. That. I'm just curious. I mean, looking at the maps, just can you inform us of what development you know that's planned that could impact our thinking? Yeah, it's a mountain. Um, <laughs> the But it's zoned, so. One thing. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we work in GIS, so these lines just go out to the Washoe County uh, boundary line. But, no, I, th I appreciate that feedback, and we'll incorporate. We actually have some graphics, um, and we'll incorporate that additional context into the future presentations. Um, I do, and I'll take the opportunity to, to comment that uh, we do have very granular information about proposed developments and timing of that, and we take... Uh, existing student generation data from those housing units and that's basically one layer, one variable that uh, helps inform those enrollment numbers. Um, 
I, this this is just an aerial image from the assessor's website. You can see this open uh, dirt under development, right? You've got your Pioneer Meadows, your Kylie Ranch, your Stonebrook. This is all inside the Stonebrook, um, or pardon me, the Bow Hatch enrollment zone. This is your five ridges. This is part of the Jesse Hall and uh, Shaw zones. Over here is where you were referring. This is all Van Gorder. And really quickly, these are these are BLM owned parcels, United States of America, and you know tremendously, uh, you know mountainous. So, so this is probably the end of development for for that region. But there is a lot of development up in this area. Our presentation to the board um, the other week focused on this quite a bit because it is rather counterintuitive. The population growth in this area is significant. It is real. People who live there and visit there see the construction happening swiftly and everywhere. Uh, they also feel it in their community, the traffic, um, just the you know, uh, participation uh, in stores and things like that. The population growth is real. The student enrollment growth is not. And so really, the, the more we analyze this in preparation for this decision point, we were somewhat surprised as staff that um, between birth rates, housing affordability, um, alternative educational opportunities uh, relative to the school district, um, that the, the total enrollment actually for this entire region at the elementary school level decreased this year versus a year ago. You know, it's, it was difficult for the trustees and even staff to really uh, come to terms with that data um, so this is actually a long-term trend across the nation and across the school district of just declining birth rates and plateauing enrollment levels. And that's, I think, in large part what led them to, you know, making the decision and providing the direction that they did. But listen, I appreciate the comment and we'll include more information on future development in the next meeting because we certainly have that information. Thank you. Adam, I do have a question about um, behind Golden Eagle Park. They have building that's going on. Is there any idea of how many houses? Because those would go to Spanish Springs, I believe. So behind Golden Eagle. Yep. No, I know what you're talking about. And it's definitely factored into uh, these projections. I don't know off the top of my head how many units or what that subdivision is called. This is what yep, you're talking that's it. about. Yep. <laughs> Along those same lines, I was wondering if the new apartments that are being put up along Vista um, Boulevard before you get to Wingfield Springs, if those are also factored in to these projections. Absolutely. Not only are those factored in, but projects that haven't even broken ground yet. The school district receives every single development application that is submitted to the city, county, or, well, Reno, Sparks, or Washoe County. Um, we receive uh, detailed information from the UNR, UNR Center for Regional Studies that also tracks all of this information. And we basically translate housing units into students per capita based on historical actuals. And that's where that number has been steadily declining, where you know, all of us might see a you know, 250 unit apartment complex going up or a 250 unit subdivision being constructed. And that's very viscerally impact like that's a lot of construction and that might actually equate to like 20 students or something like that that's surprisingly low and that that's based on um, empirical data throughout that community so to the absolute best of our ability every known and proposed development project including the schedule or anticipated absorption rate of those units because they just don't all uh, come online at the same time is factored into these projections. And as you can see, I mean, it's it's not easy predicting the future, but we work pretty hard on it. Um, despite all of that real population growth, the enrollment is actually projected to essentially remain flat throughout this entire region. Slight growth at the elementary school level. Adam? 
we've seen like the shiny new school thing before where like we do the zoning and then everybody wants to go to the new school so then it gets overcrowded because we dealt with years ago that van gorder and spanish springs were our issues and now they're undercrowded are you seeing that this is more a variance issue that people are in those neighborhoods and wanting to go i know there's that charter school up there too but what would make it that if we did this rezoning we wouldn't see this pattern again i mean we weren't expecting all those people to be in Bohatch if they were actually in that neighborhood. But are we seeing other kinds of trends that made Spanish Springs and Van Gorder so much smaller than we anticipated? You know, I think we're going to spend a lot more time uh, on our side looking at the variance impacts and co uh, discussion about that with this committee. Um, but one thing that I didn't point out on this slide, these little dots are uh, student residences. So you can just see the concentration of those dots in especially the Bohatch community um, versus uh, the Hall or certainly the Spanish Springs area. You know, and that's a function of a lot of things. But uh, to me, that says that's actually where the kids live. And there's a variety of reasons why people choose to live where they live. Um, it's not necessarily these issues are not being driven by variances alone. So we've seen the before, now we're seeing the after map of option one, and now these are the impact tables. So the table on the top represents the current conditions just for the schools that are being discussed in this option one. We've seen these numbers before, they're the same as the ones on the previous slide. This, the table on the bottom of this page are those same schools uh, and the resulting enrollments and projected enrollments at those schools. This red line here at the start of the 24-25 school year is intended to indicate the year of effect. Um, it was agendized, I believe, as such, but I think it's important to emphasize that the uh, goal or the object of this exercise is to, you know, go through this process and, and uh, make a decision and cause this change to go into effect uh, as soon as possible, meaning next school year, 24-25. So you can see Bohatch is nicely relieved with uh, enrollment-wise. You can see Spanish Springs has ample existing capacity to absorb those additional students, as does uh, Sepulveda, only a few of those folks. Van Gorder also uh, sees a significant noteworthy increase in enrollment levels, but still manages to hover in the mid 80%, mid to high 80%, 650 plus students in Van Gorder in option one. And then Shaw, again, seeing all of Van Gorder moved uh, from Sky Ranch to Shaw, uh, does creep up over 1,100 students nearing its maximum capacity. So this is a warm up. This isn't our uh, this isn't perfect, and we may never find, you know, quite that magic perfect option, but this is one we wanted to put out there for discussion. You can also see Sky Ranch obviously also uh, nicely relieved of its, uh, you know, excess enrollments. Okay. So let's move on to option two. Again, we're going to reset with our existing conditions slide. Sorry, Christy has it for the record. I just had a question. Does this alleviate the split feeder issue that you had mentioned about some of the elementary schools that does your option to eliminate that split feeder issue? So just to be clear, um, no elementary schools split feed to the middle. Um, right now, Beasley and Sepulveda go to Sky Ranch and then to Reed, and the rest of the elementary schools uh, that go to Sky Ranch, Bohatch, and Van Gorder go to uh, Shaw and then Spanish Springs. Um, you know, that in, in some way, shape, or form, Sky Ranch is going to send students to different high schools. I'm not sure if I answered your question correctly, but okay. So, option two. You can see the same neighborhood uh, moving from Bohatch to Sepulveda, the same neighborhood moving from Bohatch to Van Gorder. However, in this option, Van Gorder stays in Sky Ranch. 
And in option two, the real difference or another difference is that the area proposed to move from Bohatch to Spanish Springs is expanded. So uh, whereas previously, you know, if I had an aerial map here, you could see it was drawn on a major drainage way. That's what this line was in option one. It's important that we try to choose major geographic boundaries that sort of logically uh, separate communities. That major drainage way, while technically this is all part of the Stonebrook development, or not this part, but you know, the rest of it is, um, that drainage way is a pretty significant geographic boundary. Anyway, on option two, we're expanding this proposed uh, rezone area to include all of this polygon up to Spanish Springs, who would then also move from Sky Ranch to Shaw with the rest of Spanish Springs Elementary School. So here's what it looks like today. Here's what it would look like after the change goes into effect. You can see this larger area of Spanish Springs um, turning lighter blue to match the rest of Shaw. As we get into this more, if you're not familiar with these streets, you know, it's important. I'll take the opportunity to highlight, you know, this is La Posada Drive right here. So, you know, these kids would likely, re they would receive busing services across La Posada, but we take that into consideration often as well, the, the significance of roadways as barriers. You can see Vista Boulevard, Pyramid Highway, you know, there's reasons that we put these boundaries where we put them. But this is what option two might look like. You can see Van Gorder stay in dark blue to stay in Sky Ranch. And this is what the projected enrollments associated with that one look like. You can see Bohatch uh, being relieved by a slightly larger amount with that expanded area moving into Spanish Springs Elementary School. Spanish Springs enrollment increasing by a similar corresponding amount. Van Gorder stays the same. Sepulveda stays the same as in option one. However, uh, the difference in option two, not as many students moving from Sky Ranch into Shaw. And you can see what this looks like. So that's really the extent of the options that we developed for tonight. Um, we did want to flag for your awareness, in addition to the feedback we've already received, um, unfortunately, uh, with Bohatch opening in 2020, there is a possibility that uh, the current cohort of fourth graders could be rezoned twice in their elementary school career, which is something that we wish to avoid. So I always end up having to count on my fingers to figure this out, but you can see we put this table together for my own benefit if for nobody else. Um, you know, a potential student uh, went to Van Gorder for kindergarten, got rezoned to Bohash for first grade. They're fourth graders today and potentially would be in fifth grade uh, next year. And we'll have to account for them individually and potentially discuss uh, teasing them out, providing them transportation or not, basically not rezoning them, whereas their entire rest of their neighborhood and the, you know, kindergarten through third grade, fourth graders, uh, would be subject to this rezone. So just wanted to put that on the table. We've not encountered this before. We often talk about trying to avoid it. In this instance, we're not able to avoid it, um, but for sort of a special consideration. So I wanted to uh, draw your attention to that. Um, this slide's intended to talk a little bit more about some other considerations that we've de de debated um, in the office. I mentioned a little bit about the roadway infrastructure. Um, you don't see any options to relieve Bohatch tonight with Hall or Taylor. Um, if you recall on that original slide, there's quite a bit of uh, available capacity or even underutilization at those schools. There's significant enrollment, uh, not significant, there's, there's growth. We can see the Five Ridges development right there that's zoned for Hall, um, but we don't have any options to uh, consider relieving Bohatch with those schools, um, mostly because of Pyramid Highway. Now those schools, those students would receive transportation regardless. 
Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with these uh, signalized intersections, um, a couple of these access points are right in, right out. You know, they have that median. And so it, in one particular uh, instance, it would basically require a school bus to come down from Hall past the access point and, you know, drive around the block, basically, uh, you know, dri drive a U-turn to come back up northbound on Pyramid Highway to get into that subdivision. Um, I, I should have started with the, the intent of this slide was just to sort of prompt some additional discussion. I think the objective, if anything else tonight, is to get feedback from the public and from the committee about where you'd like to see more information or where you'd like us to explore additional options. These are some of the considerations that dr turned us away from considering Hall and Taylor, but it's certainly an option if you guys would like us to dive deeper in that direction. We also uh, wanted to prompt the committee a little bit uh, for their feedback regarding Beasley. Uh, Beasley used to attend Men Dive. They do attend Reed High School and would continue to in any of these scenarios, but today they attend uh, Sky Ranch and um, could be considered for uh, relief of, of Bohatch using, uh, con concerning this Wingfield Hills area. Um, it's not arguably not as uh, direct access to come back down Vista and up uh, Los Altos to Beasley, um, but it, the idea has merit and we didn't, while we didn't uh, craft up an option that considered that tonight, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. So these are just a couple of concepts that we've debated and we wanted to put out there for discussion, again, just to prompt your feedback and the public's feedback and of course, any and all other questions or concerns that you'd like us to delve into more deeply in October is really what tonight's about. So just a summary here, you can see um, the options one and two. You know, option one really pushes a little bit of that overcrowding up to Shaw, which is concerning. Uh, option two doesn't relieve Sky Ranch as much, not as much movement from Sky Ranch to Shaw. And, uh, you know, just, just going to continue to iterate on this with your input. And as we dive deeper, this was really just an introduction to the work that we have in front of us. So with that, I'll uh, leave it back to discussion. Thank you. All right. Um, because we have a significant amount of public here, I think we're going to take the public comment and then we'll have some discussion because I think it will help guide our discussion to hear from the people who live in these neighborhoods and might be impacted by this. So, Kelly? We have not received any public comment. Oh, may we still have no other cards? Yes, sure. Does anyone have any questions while people are filling out their cards? Not so much a question, Adriana Public, over the record. Um, my initial thoughts are the two options that have, we've been presented so far do a decent job of balancing out utilization at the elementary level, but I think there's way more work to do at the middle school, and I, I understand the challenges, so I definitely think it's worth exploring Men Dive and whatever else is out there because uh, I don't think either of the two options work for middle school at this point. Okay, here we go. Laura Lee Sutton. Hi, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And more than um, comment, I have a couple questions specifically to what he was talking about. So I'm wondering if we can get more specifics on what neighborhood or area of Stonebrook is looped into Spanish Springs Elementary in option one. Um, that looks like right around the area that I live. So I'm not sure where in that I fall. Um, the second question is thinking about, you know, the fourth graders, it would be a second school change for many of them, the consistency that students need, especially at that early age. Has there been thought about um, students being rezoned from Bohatch to Spanish Springs and completing variances, trying to stay at Bohatch and what that looks like? Um, so I, I do think our next month's presentation will 
dig in a little bit to more specifics of the neighborhood so that we can zoom in a bit on that. Um, that's kind of what it sounded like we were going to do. And just for everybody here, um, we do have administrative code from the Board of Trustees that uh, fifth graders are automatically variance into the school that they are currently at, as well as eighth graders and juniors and seniors in high school whenever there's a zoning change. So we do have administrative regulation that is very clear that there, there's not a question that those students will get um, a variance. However, I think what Adam was talking about is those particular students who will be fifth graders because that would be a double rezone that the district would be willing to work with those families potentially to make sure that those kids can not only get the variance but also get to school. Um, and I don't know what that would look like and I, I can't answer transportation questions because that is not our area. Um, but we can certainly pose those questions to transportation and make sure that that you know, it's it's put in our recommendation to the board if, if that was to be the case, that those families could could have some conversations with the, you know, with the school district to ensure the most stability for their kids. I, I know I have a rising fifth grader next year and I, I understand that would be very difficult to make multiple changes. We we made multiple changes in our school years from double diamond to pull ketis. So I, I understand that concern for sure. So we will we'll make sure that as best as possible that that double rezone is addressed if that option is what is chosen, I think. Okay, I think I saw a few more cards coming in while we were. Sorry, Sean Whistler and then Kim Crowley. Hi, Sean, thank you for being here. Hi, thank you. I'm actually the principal at Van Gorder, so some of you I know, many of you I've never met, but um, I appreciate you guys getting together and uh, discussing this. I also do really appreciate Capital Projects coming by and, and asking us, the principals, for our input. Um, there's just a couple of points I just wanted to share, and I shared this with them, so it's not a big surprise. Um, you know, in looking at it at Van Gorder, you know, they, they came and they asked, what do you think? Could your school handle this? Well, unfortunately, I have to say yes. And I, I say unfortunately because I love where my school is at right now at about 550 kids. It feels actually really nice. Um, but I also know the reality of, you know, the cost of new schools and utilizing the facilities we have. Um, you know, one thing I just... When you look at those numbers and you say, you know, our, our capacity is 764, and Adam talked about, you know, a portable holds 25 kids, all those numbers sound really great. Um, but you, there's a lot of considerations as principals we take into effect. First of all, you know, only one classroom really sits at 25, and that might be third grade. If you're really lucky, your fourth and fifth grade might be there. But realistically, you know, first and second graders sit anywhere between about 17 and 20 maximum. So there's a lot of play in those numbers, and I would say it's probably around like 10 to 15 percent. Um, and if you get really lucky, your allocations, your numbers work out fantastically. And um, I, I'm not going to lie, I've been pretty fortunate. So I don't have a lot to complain about with that. But um, one thing that as you start getting towards um, capacity and you look at Van Gorder, you know, being proposed to getting to 86, 87 percent around there, what we start losing is flexibility in our rooms, and we have a lot of special programs. We have um, programs for strategies, students with autism. We have a lot of um, students in general resource, and a lot of times those kids need quiet space to learn. Um, they require a room to do that, and a lot of the schools and places m may have some space, may have some literally closet space, but we, we do use classrooms for that. And so, so some of those are the things that start to suffer when you get past about 80%. Um, and I know every school is different, so just to try to, you know, it, it's not always like that. But I, I can honestly say that will impact us. It will impact my special education programs. Um, and, yeah, I'll figure it out. But it, it happens. The other thing that happens with this, too, is um, as our numbers go up, there are certain allocations that don't come with that. So, like, library, computers. And you guys may or may not know, but for computers, like I get one person for 21 hours a week. I got 400 plus devices in my school, plus they're expected to teach classes to all the kids. Um, now, if my school only had 300 kids, guess what? I'd still get one person, 21 hours a week. So those things don't continue to go with it. Music does, library does not. So those are some of the kind of the things that I think need to be considered. I don't think those things are in your hands. But those are things that I start processing really quickly about. Um, and like I said, I, I do appreciate you guys taking the time to go through this. Thank you. 
Thank you. That's really helpful information for us to consider. I think you said we had one more, right, Kelly? Kim Crowley. Hi, Kim. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Uh, my name is Kim Crowley. I'm the principal at Shaw Middle School. Um, and thank you for um, coming and helping me uh, talk through this before. I shared with um, uh, Brett and um, the folks in uh, Capital Projects some of my very specific concerns. And it's really about middle school. Um, middle school is a very unique time of life. Um, it's what I love the most being at. But there are certain things that we know work really well in middle school, in a middle school. Uh, for example, um, it's really important that students have choice and enough electives. Um, believe it or not, there's lots of middle schoolers who decide that reading, writing, social studies and science is not why they're going to school and really they're going because they want to socialize and they want to, um, there needs to be a reason whether it's sports and electives is really important with that. The other thing that's really important um, at middle school is we use a teaming model. I think all of our Spanish Springs middle schools uh, using teaming model and most of the middle schools in our district do, meaning that the four core contents for a cohort of students um, are the same. Those 250 or 300 students all go to those same four teachers. It creates a sense of team. It creates a sense of a little mini family in a really big school. Uh, I have many frightened sixth graders as they come up um, and that teaming really helps with that. So when you get down to the size that I'm at and Mendive's at, and I know Mr. Hartshorn feels the same, when you are at that small number, scheduling wise it's very difficult for us to keep the team model. I almost had to departmentalize like a high school where any of my 25 teachers, that's where you might end up. Um, I think that's very detrimental and I'm right on the border. The other thing is that I had to, um, I lost an allocation this year, um, originally ended up being higher than expected but still had to lose an elective. And so now my students have um, music as a choice and then either PE or art, that's it. Uh, basically. Um, I had to ask my um, gen ed teachers, I moved to a seven person schedule because I believe so much in um, electives and asked them all to teach one elective um, and the other ones to teach a support class. That's really finagling and that's a lot of preps for one teacher. Um, so my gen ed teachers right now are, are prepping for two subject areas and unfortunately I can't give them one more prep period. So I think this really affects the quality of a school for middle schoolers especially. Again, a very unique time of, um, of life and there's certain things that work really well and that are very important and that's not um, highlighted by just the numbers. Um, so I hope that you guys consider that as you're deciding between these. I too don't believe that either of these options um, are powerful. If I had a magic wish, I would love to be at 950, 1000. So that's what I want. <laughs> Thank you, that's very valuable. And just for, um, I think, information for not only the public, but, but um, our committee, we, um, we do have a Mendife teacher on our committee. Darren um, speaks for all teachers uh, and all educators on this committee, but he does have personal knowledge of Mendife. I think that's important that we're all aware of that. And um, I, I, I was just about to call her Missy, I'm sorry. Okay. Melissa um, is the assistant principal at Dilworth Middle School and also um, lives in Sparks and has been around Sparks Middle Schools and rezoning for our entire lives. FYI, we've known each other for a very long time because that's what happens when you live in Reno. Um, so, and I'm also a former middle school teacher. I taught at Sparks Middle School. So um, I, I think that that's important that if there are questions about what Kim was talking about, we, we do have some we do have some people on the, the committee to speak to that. Um, before we continue on with our discussion, a couple of things just to um, make sure that we have in our presentation that we've all kind of gotten used to is special programs at the schools. I think we have, we really, that was really, really helpful last year um, when we had a list of the pro extra programs so that we could help make decisions. At, as, um, as you mentioned, the, you know, your pre-Ks and um, special ed programs, things like that. Um, I think we already talked about variances, especially with the new district policy on variances. We're probably gonna see more than we have in the past at some of these schools. And then some neighborhood detail. Um, and then I think, 
I think it would be helpful if we had the vertical alignments. I know there's not split feeders in elementary, but we do have um, Sky Ranch is splitting between two high schools. Um, so I, I think those would be helpful. And then Tyler's um, alignment to the board policy. I'm glad that stuck in your head because I was going to bring it up too. Uh, I told you. I... <laughs> you it's awesome. <laughs> uh, so I would like to add to that list too, Adam, as we're thinking about the next time. Uh, I think last year you you, you heard us uh, and sort of th speaking directly to the, you, and you put it the, on the cover slide, but Administrative Regulation 7107, Section 4, Subsection A2, which lists the seven parameters that the Zoning Advisory Committee is supposed to make selections around related to transportation, et cetera. But like, I think it's helpful for you guys to just sort of share uh, your thoughts about how uh, we're taking those parameters into uh, consideration since that is how we are supposed to make decisions. And for new folks that are on there, it's it's in here, but there's six criteria in which we should be making and thinking about decisions that I think should be in our heads as we're as we're doing this because that's that's the guidance from the board. Also, Adam, the new maps are pretty cool. Good job on those. Thanks. I had nothing to do with it. You guys. <laughs> may remember uh, I guess pass that Rand along. Randy Baxley, yeah. uh, the man behind the curtain. He uh, rode off into the sunset uh, re in retirement this summer, and uh, you'll come to know uh, Brett Rodella. His name was mentioned earlier. He's now our uh, long-range planner for the district, school demographer, and a GIS uh, super wizard. Also inherited Randy's um, crystal ball. Yeah, the, the, the color brush fire charts are nice too. Nice job on those. So thanks. Welcome. Welcome to our, our world. <laughs> oh, also a sparks kid. Yay. Sparks. Oh, see, Reno. Yep. I was at a store the other day and my daughter was like, seriously, we cannot get out of anywhere without you to knowing someone. I'm like, one day that will come in handy for you, child. All right, um, discussion, thoughts, things you want to see that you want Brett to work on, you want Adam to work on. What are your thoughts? Anybody? Christy, as for the record, I was just curious, what happens to the temporary, what are they called? Portables. Portables. I know you don't take those into consideration for the, the full numbers, but what happens to those portables once the school is underutilized? Do they get, like, get moved or are they like permanent fixtures there or can somebody, and then this was just me thinking about the, the um, request for the special needs classrooms that they needed more space, private spaces. I just wasn't sure what, what happened to the portables once the school became uh, effectively utilized. I'm not sure if that's the right adjective, but yeah, I mean, we we try to use them as efficiently as reasonably possible. Um, you can see, for example, Spanish Springs Elementary School has had somewhere in this neighborhood of students since Bohatch opened in 2020, and yet still has one portable on their campus. They get moved when they're needed, um, but it does cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to permanently relocate one of those things. Um, so we don't we don't move them like furniture, but you know they're temporary, in the sense that some have been there for more than a decade. But absolutely, yeah. And not all of them have restrooms in them. Some of them do have restrooms. So when you have those pre-K classes when they're put into there, it's challenging when they are potty training and you need somebody to take them from the portable into the school and back and so then you have fewer you might just have one adult with many many littles so yes I should have mentioned that Kristen is our resident elementary expert <laughs> when I was orienting all of us to our school experiences so do you have a question yeah what the last time that this rezoning happened I know that it affected several of the other sparks middle schools specifically, um, and all of our enrollments went down and kind of shifted. Um, would it be possible in this to include, I know that at Dilworth, for example, and it might then affect Mendive's um, enrollment numbers is we have a weird pocket of the Catherine Dunn neighborhood that feeds into Dilworth, but then that little tiny pocket 
goes to Reed High School. And so um, this, it kind of, I think this whole process is gonna start a little bit of a domino effect for all of the Spark schools, including Dilworth, for example, because there has been a massive shift. Um, I've received many students at Dilworth from the Sparks Middle School and trainer areas. Then I then Mendive has inherited a bunch of my kids. Um, so with that said, I think that there's this little bit of a domino effect that we also need to consider if we're gonna kind of clean up the lines. Um, and with Mendive being considered as part of this, that we maybe look at that weird pocket that feeds into into me, but most of my kids end up then over at Mendive. If we clean that up, would it change their numbers before we also then consider bringing in ele elementary schools back to Mendive that were originally zoned there? I think we'll certainly uh, clarify all of the vertical alignments across yeah, our schools, maybe helpful. expand the, the boundaries. I mean, you know, you got to draw the line somewhere. I threw the current boundary up for Dunn. Um, you can see it's bounded there by Sparks Boulevard and um, matriculates in its entirety to Dilworth and then in its entirety to Reed. It's some of those residences are closer to Mendive, so I can see where that's troubling. But Dunn goes in, you know, in its entirety to Dilworth, or it's zoned all to Dilworth and then all to Reed. And I think that those vertical matriculations will be helpful because I think it's the only group of students that go to Dilworth and then read. So I think all the rest of Dilworth goes to Sparks High, I believe. So that will be helpful for us to, to kind of look at if that's an option to even have a conversation about, I don't know. But if we're gonna change Mendive, we don't wanna then this to become a, an issue and then over make Mendive over capacity because that would be not the point. <laughs> but I know that the electives have been an issue at both Shaw and um, and Mendive, so something to consider is making sure that we're leveling out our middle schools. So I think you're right on that, Adriana. That we're not quite there yet on that. Any other thoughts on Sparks, Spanish Springs, etc.? Um, I was thinking about the Sky Ranch with Beasley and um, the people that would be going from, you said Wingfield Hills would then go to Beasley. And I know that they would be able to be bused there. Um, when my kids went to Spanish Springs, I was a sub, so I drove them to school every day um, instead of having them take the bus. And, you know, for those beginning years, passed Van Gorder every day. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily be passing another school that they could see, but there's also so many lights. So you're basically making a big U, right? Because <laughs> you would be going from Wingfield Hills down Vista. There's the new light in the middle of Vista, which is challenging sometimes with all of the people that are gonna start coming out from the apartments right there. And then going up Los Altos to get to Beasley. Um, I could see, parents being frustrated with that, perhaps. Yeah, and I, I think similar to the conversations that we've had about North Valleys, I think traffic concerns um, and the directional flow of everybody driving down Pyramid, Sparks, and Vista in the mornings, and then vice versa. I mean, I've tried to drive to my parents' house at five o'clock in the afternoon and will never do that again. Um, so I, I, I do know that we've talked about that when it comes to North Valleys and made some decisions. So we can certainly have a conversation about that when we get some more maps. I um, mean, really think about, like you said, the Vista issue. And um, I know the directionality of traffic in the mornings and in the afternoons can be cumbersome for families. So something to consider. I, I was just hoping, Adam, and I know, I mean, crystal ball and all, but it, it seems over the last couple of years, we've erred on the side of the new school and new developments where the population is a question. And, and I, I understand the bind you're in and the board is in, even politically, to open a new building and have it open empty or, or less crowded. Um, but I also see 
even the frustration maybe as taxpayers in the fact that we opened these and you know I found out Sky Ranch got their first trailer when my daughter came home and said she was going to Spanish out in a trailer and I'm like what are you talking about you're going to Spanish in a trailer knowing that Mendive at that point had about eight to ten classrooms completely empty at that point um, it, it, maybe I'm just a social science guy and like to write an essay instead of look at numbers but is there any any way to take into consideration that open space that you're dealing with because it seems as recently from Polakitas to Bohatch to Sky Ranch that we've we've opened with surrounding areas and those numbers have tended to be higher when we've taken away from areas that are pretty sound and I would say Dunn, Beasley, Mendai, that whole area had been pretty stable um, and, and I know Shaw has more has a different little has more problems right we can fill our our holes at Mendive because we have enough kids who can drive in from other schools for variances Shaw on the other hand is stuck because they have no other outline no other community that would use them as a variance plus you have all that space and possible new homes out there um, as a focus on trying to take settled areas with less ability to grow like Southern Sparks and leave yourself more wiggle room in places like Sky Ranch um, just so we're not rezoning or spending the money to bring in mobiles that are then going to stay there and I just I don't know if that's a policy thing if it's a numbers thing but it just seems to be a trend recently and I know it's completely tricky um, but I think maybe tending towards older settled neighborhoods being settled into schools instead of taking them out into newer schools and I know it's always nice to have a newer building but um, that might help um, I just like you said no one really believes the numbers of Spanish Springs when you live out there especially when Bohatch in two years has four trailers because the question becomes when when does it stop um, is four trailers where that number stops or is it five next year or six and I I would tend just personally and like I said social science guy to believe my eyes with the trailers there over two years as opposed to the numbers that we see have seen that said Sky Ranch and Bohatch were going to be flat. All right. Any other thoughts, questions? Adam. Yeah. New guy questions here, Adam. A Adam Anderson, for the record. Um, it was great to hear some public comment from our school administrators. When you're when you're just looking at the the data that you provide here, and for example, I look at Van Gorder, and under both these options, it goes from a 72 percent utilization rate into the mid 80s. Doesn't seem that bad. Well, here we have the principal that took his time to come speak with us tonight. If, if you were just, if we were to just do an even distribution and it was just across the board, do you have, a, do you know where we would land as far as um, utilization rate for the elementary schools if it was just evenly distributed across those schools? Yeah, this this slide here um, is just total capacity divided by total enrollment across those seven elementary schools. 76, 78 percent. Um, it's not that simple. There's roads and mountains in the in the way. Um, you know, this area I wanted to mention. You know, historically went to Van Gorder, um, and for many years Van Gorder operated with well north of 700 students in it. It's not ideal. Um, the comment was absolutely correct that there does need to be some wiggle room. That 10 to 15 percent. Um, is actually right on. I mentioned earlier we don't like to operate our schools at maximum capacity. Um, some of these scenarios that potentially have, for example, Van Gorder at with a nice 10 to 15 percent cushion, um, you know, it's a draft option for consideration. Sure. Okay, that's helpful. Well, w one other question. Um, you talked about how it was surprising to see the enrollment 
flat or even decline. There's a, a dividing line on your chart there between the 2008, um, 2020, 2029, 2029, 2030, where we see the most dramatic drop. Is there something that's happening there or is that just part of the projections? No, apologize for that. That was just formatting, you know, five years and drew an outline on the cell. No. Uh, that does, there's no change there. Okay. Understood, thank you. I've just got one question on, on option two. I'm, I'm struggling, and just if you could clarify on the map, Adam, how Sky Ranch gets sort of all of the growth from option two. Can you explain that to me again? Just to me, it, it looks like option two is actually moving more of the Sky Ranch population to Shaw. And so I'm trying to see why is option two Sky Ranch turning into sort of yellow? Where, is, where, where are the students coming? in option two that are creating Sky Ranch growth? Or is it that there's not enough movement? That, um, in option two, we've just got this expanded area um, of Stonebrook moving all into Spanish Springs. So all of these students and future students would matriculate to Shaw. That's the only relief uh, that Sky Ranch receives in option two. And so you just see, I see. Okay. this is the underlying sort of uh, curve you see uh, up above. They peak a little bit. They're projected to peak and then uh, flatten out and decline a little bit. That peak is, is just uh, softened in option two. So perhaps an option two with some, some also potential options for Beasley and Sepulveda to see what those numbers would look like at Mendive could could give us a, a broader view of, of the middle school, which is I think where Adriana was going is, it's like we just need a little bit more because in the first option it was almost too much and then, then Shaw's overcrowded. And then in the second option it's just not quite enough. So if we can utilize Mendive, which we know has some space, through the fact that Sepulveda and Beasley are already going to read, which is where Mendive's kids go, that seems like that's a good place to start with some option 2B or 3 or I don't know, are we going to do the whole alphabet like we did oh, yeah. <laughs> with Jay Wood Raw? I mean, yeah, so that would be where I would start next is to really look at like how we can utilize the other Sparks Middle Schools um, to support that that movement there we will okay. I mean that's why this was a warm-up yeah next month your head's gonna hurt we're gonna throw a lot of options at you and you're gonna be really frustrated because you're gonna want a little bit from all of them and we'll work through it we'll figure it out there's variances there's special programs oh my gosh Beasley doesn't fit in men dive shoot uh, you know and we're gonna yeah. be ready for that after this okay I'd also next time to the Van Gorder community would appreciate some public comment uh, on moving Van Gorder to Shaw. I think hearing from the principal at Shaw that like there's actually interest in maximizing the facility more, that you get, com get community feedback on that change I think would be helpful. Okay, anything else? All right, we're gonna close that item out and let's hear about the FMP or the facility modernization plan. Item 2.08, updates and information on district-wide facility, facilities modernization plan. All right, thanks folks. This one, I'm just gonna speed through. I really wanted to just put this on a public meeting agenda and put it in front of all of you active concerned members of our community. This is an ongoing process um, that is really actively soliciting public input. So that's that's the take. If you learn nothing tonight, please take the survey and share it with your friends and family. This is a district-wide study that's being uh, executed by our consultant, Canon Design, that is analyzing all of our existing school facilities in an effort to uh, improve the level of facility equity from our existing schools to our newest schools. The goal is to develop a 10 to 15 year program of projects that the school district might diligently pursue and, and really redirect the majority of our capital resources towards our existing schools uh, to, to modernize them 
to, to levels like what we see at Bowhatch and Sky Ranch in terms of facility itself. So our, our team, our consultant, uh, as well as our capital projects team have been uh, working to develop draft options. Um, these are underpinned by um, guiding principles and extremely heavily, richly data informed. Uh, we've been working with leaders in the community, leaders within the school district, and now actively engaged with the community. A number of community forums and surveys and tons and tons and tons of information have been shared with the community in uh, meetings such as this. I think we're up to five presentations now under our belt to the Board of Trustees um, that involve a wide range of possible outcomes. These are pretty bold proposals. Um, since we're kind of talking about this area, um, I'll just mention one of the draft options, one of a handful associated with Trainer, Sparks Middle, and Doeworth considers the major renovation of trainer into a K-8 facility on the existing campus and the complete replacement of Sparks Middle School with a brand new larger middle school that would uh, require the rezoning of Dilworth into that new middle school in combination with Sparks um, and then the complete renovation of Dilworth into a new modern elementary school and the combination of you know, Lincoln Park and Greenbrae. Yeah, trust me, this is really mind bending, really bold. Um, it results in what they like to term as uh, trade up scenarios. It does result in some school consolidations and closures, but it puts those students in more modern, uh, equitable facilities relative to some of the newest schools in our district. They are in the midst of analyzing and proposing all these options and communicating with the public and soliciting feedback uh, all across the district. Every school in the district is being considered. Even if it's brand new, Sky Ranch will fall into the category of you know, routine maintenance. We're not gonna modernize Sky Ranch. Um, but with these schools, the schools I mentioned are all in excess of 60 years old. Um, and when you go into these schools, it is never an indictment of the amazing work and the miracles that are brought to bear every day inside those classrooms. It is purely a measure of the facility itself. And with the resources, the, the WC1 revenues and the property tax revenues that continue to persist and the plateauing enrollments district-wide, we're now able to shift those resources towards our existing schools. And in order to do that in a, in a data informed and equitable way. We're going through this rigorous process to develop this plan, make it very transparent, very public. And just like the zoning decisions, the final decisions are made better for more significant public and community engagement. Uh, part of these proposals will include potentially planned new schools, um, multiple schools that are being considered for reconstruction some of them listed here. None of these decisions have been made with the exception of Vaughn. These are absolutely still draft options under consideration. That's why, if for no other reason, again, we're here to amplify the request for engagement, participation in the survey, et cetera. But really exciting options at the same time. These are complicated, but good problems to have. Grade reconfiguration, I mentioned a possibility of a K-8 at Trainer. There's also a scenario that considers a K-8 over in Sparks and on the Pine campus as a possibility. It's a draft option uh, that we want feedback from the community on what works best, what appeals to you, what do you think would be uh, the best solution. Consolidations, uh, one of the preconditions they're emphasizing cons consistently is that these are only with trade up scenarios. We're very, very blessed again with these uh, capital revenue streams to not have to just slam two elementary schools with 225 students in each of them into a single school capable of holding 600 students and no additional upgrades. We're looking at um, truly 
value add scenarios at the cost of change. And that's, that's the conversation we're trying to have with the community. Uh, you heard from the middle school principal tonight the value of sort of, uh, I don't want to say economies of scale, but really a critical mass of enrollment, right? Our resources to these schools, mostly in terms of personnel, are tied to enrollment. And so when you have moderately to significantly underutilized or under-enrolled schools, we have something on the order of 15 elementary schools today with less than 300 students enrolled in them. All but one of them are more than 60 years old. Trainer, Sparks, Dilworth, all in the 600 plus or minus student enrollment. You know, you heard tonight that sweet spot hovers closer to 1,000. So looking at scenarios to potentially achieve that critical mass and do so in an, a physical environment that is inspiring to staff as well as students to work in those types of facilities and also concentrates, co concentrates those resources so that they can the, the staff can provide that richer experience to the students. That's really what this conversation is about. But we have shown the public all of these draft, op draft options, and it's a little emotional. You know, this change is significant. These schools have been in those communities for generations, quite literally. Um, and so this last bullet is a nod to that repurposed surplus facility. So the one I often use as an example, if we were to repurpose that trainer, uh, campus into a K-8 or a larger elementary school in any of those scenarios, Duncan would be uh, consolidated into the new school and that building at Glen Duncan Elementary School would no longer be needed to be operated as a K-5 elementary school. That doesn't mean it's uh, bound for demolition. It's what would a higher and better use for that facility be in our community? Could it be a pre-K center, a regional early childhood center? Could it be a daycare center operated in partnership with the Boys and Girls Club or the city of Reno? Could it be something else? We don't know, but those are options A, B, C, and D uh, for future consideration after these capital projects are enacted. So some real opportunity, and this is, you know, the, long, the list is long in Old Sparks. I mean, Green Bray, Kate Smith, Drake, um, Maxwell, all 60 years old and uh, relatively small enrollments. Lots of opportunities there. I talked about some of these just, uh, just now, consolidation, repurpose. I think this next slide talks about the time scale. That's, I think, always important context. You know, while we are talking very literally and specifically about these dominoes and what might occur, we're talking on the timeline scale of major construction projects. So, you know, to rebuild, I think this illustrates um, uh, potentially like a Vaughn scenario. So under construction for a new Vaughn Middle School, that's not slated to open until 2026. That might beget the vacating of the Pine Middle School enrollment. You guys will hear more about that in coming months, don't worry. But there's a scenario that results in no students going to school on the Pine campus, thereby allowing us to enact a major capital project on that campus, perhaps into a new modern major or uh, large elementary school, which then could result in the vacating of the Smithridge campus and or Dodson combination, et cetera. Now we're in a scenario where we are repurposing Smithridge. That is emotional and scary and significant to folks until we pencil it out on a chronological scale and we say that that outcome at the soonest is only likely to occur in the 2029, 2030 or 2030 timeframe. And that, you know, gets people back down to, a, okay, I can talk about this uh, level. But these are the types of conversations that we're having with the public that we want their input on. I should mention this survey is pretty intense. You know, it's not just a yes or no type of thing, but it does allow you to self-select the neighborhoods or the schools that you're interested in commenting on. So you don't have to go through a whole bunch of generic stuff. Some identifiers, if you're willing, you know, hey, I'm a staff member, I'm male, I have children, et cetera. Uh, but then if you wanna pick a couple or all the, the verticals, you can drill on very specific questions and options related to that. There's also video tutorials explaining some of these options 
um, both verbally and with these maps um, in real time. So it takes a moment, but the more input that we get, the more valuable this plan will be. We are hoping, uh, I think this is, this is the current engagement schedule. You can see the number of meetings that we've hosted dating back to April in the community and really been on a tear. Uh, was at Reed High School just last night. We'll be at O'Brien Middle School on Monday. We're hosting two meetings exclusively in Spanish next week. We've had translation for all the meetings. These coming two are actually going to be uh, uh, exclusively in Spanish, but the time is running short. So I wanted to take the opportunity with you guys here tonight, kind of overachievers on the uh, knowledge knowledge side here to really spread the word and understand what we're doing. Because we want to land this by the end of 2023. We'll be back before the board at least twice um, in hopes of taking a plan, and it is merely a plan, uh, to the board for their approval. That will then cause us to bring forward items for action um, as we normally do with construction contracts and things like that. Plans are always subject to change, but this is an important foundation for our capital program for many, many years to come, and now is the time in which we can influence that or author it. Um, these are the actual dates. Um, of our upcoming meetings with our internal stakeholder group, our, you see the CFPC, that's one of your sister advisory committees to the Board of Trustees, the Capital Funding Protection Committee. We've presented to them numerous times as well. Multiple city council members and elected officials sit on that committee from around the region. And then you see implementation um, starting right away in 2024, pending this approval. We wanna bring these uh, modern modernizations and these these really transformative opportunities to as many schools as we can as quickly as we can all right that's it going back to the uh, survey slide washoschoolsnet slash fmp check it out there is a bottomless set of links of information and that's where you find the survey thank you I wanted to say about the survey, um, definitely set aside a good chunk of time because if you leave it and then get distracted for a little bit, you start over again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was just going to see if Kelly could email all the board, the, this committee, the link to that page. Um, not that we can't find it, but the link to the actual survey and then people could share it out with family and friends and their their local community that they represent. That would be really cool. Sounds great, we'll do that, thank you. I was just wondering, when you go to communities multiple times, like I see Pines on here three times, one's in Spanish, so maybe it's just different audience, right? But you're going to incline twice. I wonder what the intention is around visiting communities more than once with these conversations. Great question. I mean, the short answer is we prioritized this calendar based on the perceived level of intense intensity and significance of change that's um, being proposed in their region. So we're not going to Spanish Springs High School, for example, um, but yeah, between Vaughn and Pine and multiple school consolidation options on the table, we wanted to make sure that we tried extra hard to, to communicate and engage with that community. Great, any other? Questions? Yeah. And when I take the survey, I'll probably know the answer to this, but is um, accommodating people with disabilities and employee safety um, or student safety part of the modernization options? Yeah, 100%. Simply put, we're looking at the newest schools as the benchmark and taking each and every one of our existing schools and trying to devise ways to level the playing field to increase the parity to increase the equity from a facility standpoint baseline safety security accessibility that's minimum mandatory we're talking about um, really all of the elements that you see in our newest schools and trying to come up with ways whether it's modernization you know major renovation or complete replacement construction those are the types of projects that we're hoping to bring to bear all across our district
it's fun to talk about, but when push comes to shove, there's change involved. So I don't want to be glib about the level of impact that this may have. Um, we think it's for the best, but we don't want to do it without the uh, engagement and support of our community. Any other questions about the FMP? Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Adam. That was really helpful. Looking forward to big changes. And I think, I think it's worth mentioning that the modernization of our buildings would not have happened if it wouldn't have been for the WC1 money. And I think that that was, and I mean, that's just my opinion, but I think that that was one of the first times that our community really showed how important investing in schools, that it was absolutely worth it. And I think our legislative session showed that our state believes in investing in schools. So that's, we had a record monumental investment in our schools this last year. And now we've got some funding that we can modernize our schools and we're caught up on building, which is, feels kind of cool for right now. Like we're not needing to rush to build a brand new school so we can really focus on some of our other schools that have been waiting and waiting for WC1. So this is really exciting for our community. Um, I, I personally went to one of those uh, sheep shed schools and <laughs> I, can, I can say that I don't think much has changed since I was in elementary school in that school. So I'm excited to see what um, Canon comes up with for these options. So um, if that is it, we will move to closing. Do we have any other public comment for closing? No public comment. All right, well. If there is nothing else from the committee, we will adjourn this meeting at 7.31, two hours. Go us, good job team. <laughs> <laughs>